Good morning, everyone. My topic is on the economics of healthcare. To understand these economics, I will first define what healthcare is. Healthcare is the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of disease, illness, injury, and any other physical and mental impairments in humans. There are generally five ways of funding healthcare taxes, public health insurance, private health insurance, out of pocket payments, and donations to health charities. The United States healthcare system operates under a mixed market economy, which means healthcare is funded by the government and the private sector. However, in other developed countries like Canada, France, Germany, and the UK, public healthcare is available for all their citizens, which is free and paid for by taxes. However, private healthcare companies are free to compete next to the public options as well. Since most of us live in the United States, I'm going to educate everyone on U.S. healthcare. Currently, the United States spends more money than any other developed country in the world. Don't believe me? Listen to this. What's wrong with this picture? A lot, actually. The United States ranks 28th in life expectancy, and yet we pay more for health care than any other country in the industrialized world. 34 Nation Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development is out with a rather stunning report on all this. It shows 27 nations live longer than we do, led by Japan. Yet Americans pay nearly $8,000 per person per year for health care, more than any other country in this report. Meanwhile, despite high uh, spending on health care in the United States, Americans actually get less care than many other nations. America also leads all nations when it comes to expensive medical procedures, things like knee replacements, MRIs, and CT scans. As for pharmaceuticals, they cost about 60% more here in the U.S. than in most European countries. T.R. Reid had an excellent editorial in the Washington Post uh, where he explained it. It's not even really an editorial. It's uh, uh, some research that he's done that he explained. And let me tell you who he is. He's the uh, former Washington Post reporter and the author of The Healing of America. Uh, so what he did was he went and researched different uh, healthcare um, industries uh, throughout the, the world. Uh, the U.S. health insurance companies, on average, uh, pay 20 cents of every dollar for administrative costs, 20 cents of every dollar. Now you might say that sounds like a lot, or you might say, okay, maybe that's just the cost of doing business. Well, let's go to other countries and find out if that's the case or not. In France, where they have public health insurance, ah, oh, socialized, terrible, administrative, administrative costs equal four cents on every dollar, a fifth as much as the U.S. Uh, in Canada, oh, they're up to six cents on the dollar. Uh, in Taiwan, it's one and a half cents for every dollar goes to, uh, in healthcare costs, goes to administrative costs. And in fact, it went up to two cents, and they had nearly had a right. And uh, the party that was running was in a world of trouble, and they had terrible political trouble, because they're like, administrative costs were two percent. Outrageous. Here in America, with our lovely, best in the world, insurance system, administrative costs are 20 percent. In Japan, uh, they, uh, in the view of the conservatives, they would say, oh, they abuse the system, because Japanese, on average, this is a stunning number, go to the doctor 15 times a year, okay? <laughs> See that? If you have socialized medicine, they go to the doctor 15 times a year, and imagine the costs involved in that. Well, we have those costs. In Japan, uh, the average uh, person spends $3,400 per person on health care. In the U.S., it's over 7000 twice as much. They go to the doctor three times as much as we do, and we pay over twice as much because our system sucks. That's why we're trying to change it. And meanwhile, the Republicans and some of those corporatist Democrats are holding on for dear life. No, don't change it. Don't change it. We're making money on that. One of the reasons is, and this is a stunning fact, do you know how much an MRI costs in the, uh, Japan? Here in the U.S. it costs $1,500. And in my mind, whenever I think of an MRI, it sounds really expensive, right? In Japan, same exact MRI, same exact one, $98.
because we have a ridiculous system that encourages the health care providers to overcharge. Now, that's not going to get solved only through a public option. There's many different things you have to do. Okay, and that whole, but our whole system is rotten at its core. It doesn't make any sense. It's grossly inefficient. You think that's bad? Currently, in U.S. healthcare, we're spending approximately 16% of our GDP. The Health and Human Services Department of the federal government expects that healthcare, that our share of GDP in healthcare, will rise to 19.5% of GDP in 2017. If I do the math right, 16% of $14 trillion of GDP is about $2.24 trillion a year that we spend in healthcare. Healthcare reform was passed last year in the month of March 2010 by the Obama administration. The law includes a large number of health related provisions that take effect in the year 2014. And it also it includes expanding Medicaid to people who make up 133% of the federal poverty line. Subsidizing insurance premiums for people making up to 400% of the federal poverty line. And the federal poverty line is $88,000 for a family of four. So if you make 33% more than the federal poverty line, or you make 400% more than the federal poverty line, you're going to get subsidized, subsidized somewhere, either through Medicaid or just through subsidies itself. But there's a video that I have that doesn't make me feel as comfortable about healthcare reform. Check it out. You remember how um, the healthcare that, uh, reform that was passed was historic and it was gonna keep rates down and, uh, and don't worry about a thing? Um, and now, remember uh, Blue uh, Anthem Blue Cross had tried to raise rates in the middle of healthcare reform by 39%. And President Obama stepped in and said, oh, no, you can't do that. And he had a regulator say that they had to go back and look at things again, et cetera, et cetera. And I love LA Times writing about this. And every, this is the conventional wisdom. I've seen it a million places where they say, and that turned things around. And when it looked like health care wasn't going to pass, then Obama used that to rally people to pass health care from. Look, I, dude, I was there. You were there with me, man. You remember every day I was, into, I was telling you? It's going to pass. That's not the question. What's in it? That's the question. Right? All this fake drama, all this nonsense, so that the storyline could be, oh, but then he came and he did a comeback and he passed it and he really stuck it to him. Well, he must have. Because I must be wrong because I criticized that bill because there must be checks on the cost. Remember, G. Chair, do you remember that was my number one concern? Do we have check on the cost? And they told us, no, of course we do. Of course we do. Now you want to know how much... Um, Blue Shield in California is raising rates for individual holders. 59 percent. 59 percent. 59 percent. No, no, no. Costs are under control. Don't worry, man. They got this thing on lockdown. You leave the private insurance guys in charge and they will do the right thing. Don't worry, the profit motive in the free market always works out. So you just have to pay 59% more a couple of months after they pass the reform. Now look, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that it is the fault of reform that we, and, and that is the reason why the number is going up. No, my problem with reform was that it would not prevent the number from going up. They told us that it would, and I knew, I read the bill. I said, no, that, there's nothing in here that would prevent that. And, and I said that they, would, they could raise it any number they like. And people just scoffed at me. Said, oh, come on, Jank. You don't know how they can. Don't be ridiculous. <laughs> See, they stopped it at 39%. 
By the way, in the LA Times article, you got to understand, it's not just uh, Blue Shield. There's Anthem Blue Cross is raising it there. And there's so many numbers. They raised it by 21% a couple of months ago. Then they raised it by another 10% and another 7%, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody's raising, raising, raising. They say, oh, well, we got more costs. What can we do? What can we do? Oh, it's still unprofitable for us. What can we do? My assets unprofitable. <laughs> We've shown you the numbers where they're making record profits at these healthcare insurance companies. <laughs> what a joke this all is. And look, some positive provisions kick in in 2014. That's the other thing I told you. We're not going to make it to 2014. We barely got into 2011. That's three to four years down the road. I mean, imagine if they raise the prices 59% every year. And it's been close to that. And the raises are getting larger and larger as we go. No, hey, look, I could be wrong. It hasn't happened yet, but it could be wrong. <laughs> God, it's too much. It's happened plenty of times. But look, I tell you what's going to happen ahead of time. I'm not a Monday morning quarterback. And then it happens. If that didn't make you doubt reform, I have no other video that probably, yeah, probably, yeah, I do. But that should have done no job. To give you a better idea or example of how much money we actually waste in healthcare, brain surgery in the States cost $35,000, but in India, $6,000. What are we doing? Someone's overcharging. There are problems with healthcare. Maybe some of you have experienced it, maybe some of you haven't. But for those that haven't experienced it, or for those who haven't experienced the extreme versions of it, I got videos that are probably going to want you to rip your own hair out. <sighs> Take a look. Andy Harris is a, a guy who just won in office, so he's a representative elect, and he's gonna come in uh, next year, he's a Republican, of course, uh, from Maryland, and uh, they're doing orientation and they're telling him what their health care plan is, etc. And he finds out that there's actually a 28 day gap before he starts getting his health care. And he's very upset by this, raises his hand, and he asks, like, Whoa, What's going on with this gap? This is crazy. I, I need that government health care right away. By the way, of course, he ran against government run health care, but it gets better. And this is reported by Politico. So they say to him, no, sorry, that's just the way the system works. It, it'll kick in 28 days later, uh, but you're going to be all right. Just settle down for a second. I know you're dying for government-run health care, but just hold on a second. And then he says, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's got to be some government option that I buy into in those 28 days. That would be the public option, which we pushed for. <laughs> and the Republicans hate it. And he ran his campaign against. Now, of course, when it's his ass on the line, classic Republican. Where's my public saying, there's got to be a government option that I could at least buy into. Please give me that government option. For other people, oh, hell no, 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 no. Me and my family, we need that. Of course, the government-run health care program that they have uh, in the House and the Senate is awesome. That's why they don't have to worry like you and I do about health care, because they get top of the line. It's really sick. Back in 2009, the U.S. Census Bureau reported about 50.7 million Americans, almost 10 million of them being illegal, did not have health insurance because they were eligible for it. While our senators have their top of the line health insurance, it's about 16.7%. In 2009, I bet it's higher now. It should be probably around 17%. 17.1% Americans who do not have health insurance. Kid is born, his name is Alex Lang, calling him uh, baby Alex, which makes sense. He has a pre-existing con condition and he won't be covered. You know what his pre-existing condition is? He's too fat. Okay, but he was born that way, right? Well, sorry, a pre-existing condition inside the womb. Uh, we're not going to cover him, okay? Now, I want to show you a little news report on this because it's so amazing that you're like, no, come on, that couldn't be true. And you're going to hear someone justifying it inside the news report. Then I'll come back and tell you more amazing facts about it. 
All right, let's check out the story of baby Alex. Imagine having a perfectly healthy two-month-old baby and having your insurance tell you that they won't cover him. Well, baby Alex is perfectly healthy with no pre-existing conditions, but because of his size, he was turned down for health insurance. His height and weight put him in the 99th percentile according to CDC guidelines, and the insurance cutoff is at the 95th percentile. Dr. Speedy with Rocky Mountain Health Plans admits that it's a flawed system. Unfortunately, when we try to sell people insurance, we have to, a number has to be, t be used as a cutoff. Dr. Speedy says your weight is not an absolute determinant of health, but since insurance is based on statistics, companies have to go on what works for the masses, not for the individual. Dr. Speedy says this is just one more reason his industry is leaning toward health care reform. Cute little baby. Cute little baby denied. Okay. His industry is leaning towards health care reform? Mm, I must have missed that one. It seemed to me that they were leaning against reform. And I love that justification. Well, we had to do a cutoff somewhere. Uh, no, you didn't. How about you could have covered all the babies? Here's what happened. First, they have the baby, and the air insurance says, oh, we're going to raise your rates 40%. They're like, come again? Are you kidding me? They're like, no, no, your baby's, uh, we had no choice. It's in the 99th percentile. Raise them 40%, right? So they go looking for a new insurer, and their new insurers say, I'm sorry, um, but uh, he has a pre-existing condition. He's a fat ass as a baby, okay? And they literally called and said, quote, your baby is too fat. Okay, so Bernie Lang is his father. <laughs> I love this guy. You know what he said? He's breastfeeding. We can't put him on the Atkins diet or on a treadmill. He's a baby. <laughs> well, seriously, what are they supposed to do? <laughs> no, no, uh, we had to do a cutoff somewhere. We had to deny some of your babies. What were we supposed to do? Cover all your babies? <laughs> of course we're not going to do that. How else would we make money? And these are the guys we're supposed to trust? <laughs> no, 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 don't worry. You don't want a public option or anything like that. The private insurers will take care of it. <laughs> Unless your baby's too fat, in which case they won't. It's not like they fed at McDonald's. They didn't do anything. It's just breast milk. He was born that way. Hey, you better not have a baby that's too fat. I don't know if you can control it or not, but sad day for you. Otherwise, 40% hike. Do you know what a 40% hike in your insurance is? It's only enormous. And if you want to get new insurance, <laughs> forget about it. You're done. You're done. James Barone uh, is a resident of North Carolina, and he has several different ailments, okay? He has a growth on his chest, two ruptured discs in his back, and he also has a left foot problem. So uh, he does not have health, have health insurance. Uh, he needed care immediately, so he decided to go to a bank, rob the bank of one dollar, and then after writing that note to the teller saying that they're being robbed, he went and sat there waiting for the police to arrive so he can go to jail and receive health care. Yeah, look, this is the state of our country, man. He used to be a delivery guy for Coke, and then uh, he lost his job. And he's doing odd jobs here and there, working part-time uh, in a grocery store. You know, he's trying to get by, right? That's, that's what he's trying to do. But he's like, I got this problem in my chest. I'm worried to death about it. I got this big thing bulging out of my chest. Mm -hmm. If I go to the emergency room, they go, well, it's not an emergency yet because you're not about to die, okay? Uh, but can you look at it? Nope, can't look at it, go back home, right? So now he doesn't have health care, what's he supposed to do? Well, you know, Obama's health care program is supposed to cover people like this, we think, we hope, right? But it doesn't start till 2014. Right. So he's like, so I got this huge growth on my chest, am I supposed to wait three years? What the hell am I gonna do? And he figures, well, the only place I can find it is in prison, health care. Right. And he's, and he's right. So we got a little video on this. Let's watch it. First time I've ever been in trouble with the law. So it's not, you know, it was, um, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm sort of a logical person. And that was my logic. That's what I came up with. That is how James Verone says he came to the decision to rob the RBC bank on New Hope Road on Thursday of last week. He had no gun, but handed the teller a rather unusual note. The note said, uh, if this is a bank robbery, please only, uh, please only give me one dollar. Then he did the strangest thing of all. I 
started to walk away from the teller, and then I walked back and I said, I'll be sitting right over here on the, on the chair waiting for the police. And that's what he did. Listen to the teller on the 911 call to police. He's sitting on the surface as you walk in the front door. Okay. So why did he do everything he could to get arrested? Because I wanted to make, make it known to whoever would know that, you know, it wasn't done for the monetary value. It was done for, you know, medical reasons. That's right. James Verone says he has no medical insurance. He says he has a growth of some sort on his chest, two ruptured discs, and a problem with his left foot. He's 59 years old and with no job and a depleted bank account. He thought jail was the best place he could go for medical care and a roof over his head. You wanted them to arrest you. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I went in knowing I was going to jail. James is hoping for a three-year sentence. He figures he'd then be able to collect Social Security when he gets out and says he'd head for the beach. I already got a condominium, um, spoken to the realtor uh, on Myrtle Beach. He says he's getting good medical care now, but the jail doctor accuses him of manipulating the system. If it's called manipulation, then out of necessity, because I need medical care, then I guess I am manipulating the courts to get medical care. God bless his heart. I, I love the jail employee. Would you look at that, ripping off the system by going to jail. So what do you want him to do, die? Okay, is that his two options? Well, you know what, if I was stuck in a situation like that, and that's the only place, don't, don't you get it? that it's a ten times worse indictment of our system, of our society, that he has to do that, that he's that desperate? And you think the problem isn't the system? The problem that it's he's ripping off the system? I mean, people have no sense to them. And look at what he's saying. He's like, he's literally dying to get to Social Security, right? Mm -hmm. So that he could pay for health care, et cetera, et cetera. And what is the current proposal in Washington for this? Well, the Republicans are saying, repeal Obamacare, so this guy never gets treated, right? And then raise the retirement age for Social Security and Medicare, so, nope, you won't be safe then either. You've got to go all the way to 69. And after passing that legislation, the Republicans will tackle health care within the prison system. <laughs> yeah. And they'll say, you know what? They'll see this, and a Republican mindset will be like, oh, apparently we're giving too much health care in the uh, prisons. Let's go stop that, right? So they start dying in the prisons. It, no, it's outrageous. And... Uh, you know, the, the other part of it that I got was, you know how uh, so many Democrats and Republicans say, well, people are living so much longer now. Why don't they just go back to work? They just work till 69. What's the difference, right? The guy's got two ruptured discs. He's got the problem with his foot, etc. So the, it, somebody wrote an email to us, which is great. He said, what if you're a roofer? Mm -hmm. That's your job. You're a roofer. You want the roofer to go back out there at 68, 68, whatever. Let's say he's like this guy. He's got a ruptured. You want him on top of a roof. You want him doing construction. You want him doing this. Well, what the hell, man? I mean, they're not even going to make it to 69. I know. And but we, they don't care about that. You think Republicans care if a roofer is in terrible condition to work? They don't care. Oh, well, sorry. Suck it up. Find another job. Work as a barista. Do whatever it takes to pay for your health care. That's, that's the mindset that Republicans have. With so many sick people without health insurance, with premiums going up 25%, 59%, 7%, 31%, do you think these companies aren't making any money? Let's check it out. One final note for you guys today, and it's on health care. We were told during the reform effort that the insurance companies were doing the best they could, and that they had to keep raising our premiums because they were so squeezed on costs. Well, the profit statements for the top 10 health insurance firms are out for the first three quarters of this year. And you're going to be shocked to find out that they actually made a great deal of money in profit. Ah, didn't see that coming. Combined, they made over $9.3 billion in profits, and that doesn't even count the last three months of this year and their profits went up a whopping 41 percent in the last year alone what happened i thought they were telling us how much they were suffering and how much obama busted them up it turns out they continue to make money at a phenomenal rate now some will say wait 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 they're supposed to do that they're not nonprofits. they're supposed to make money well that's right but that's exactly my point. Do we really want to leave our decisions about our health and our lives to a corporation whose sole purpose is to make money off of us? They get billions in profits by taking in more money from us than they pay out for our care. 
I'm not sure that makes a lot of sense, but I do know that I'd love another option. By the way, the outgoing head of the Ways and Means Health Subcommittee, Democratic Congressman Pete Stark, has asked them to return their profits in the form of premium reductions for you guys. Hmm. What do you think the chances that's going to happen? <laughs> Not very high. I'm going to warn you right now. Don't hold your breath. Besides, if you get hurt doing that, they ain't going to cover that either. <laughs> All right. When we were doing health care reform, um, my main complaint was, hey, listen, we didn't change the system, right? Now, how many times did you guys hear me say that, right? Only a million and a half. And I said, look, my main problem isn't any particular thing, oh, public option or this or that. It's just the heart of the system is exactly as it was before with private insurance companies still left in charge, right? So, and then, of course, I was dismissed by the Obama lovers and Obama himself and Robert Gibbs and said, oh, you oh they'll never be satisfied with anything. Oh, please. Historic health care reform. Historic. Mission accomplished. What are you talking about, right? So, um, one of the things that was historic about it, apparently, was that uh, they study immediately that you will not be able to discriminate against children uh, with pre-existing conditions anymore, which is fantastic. And look, I said there was always sort of good things in the bill, right? And uh, it, starting in 2014, you're not going to be able to uh, discriminate against anybody with a pre-existing condition. But immediately, we were going to start with no discrimination against children with pre-existing conditions. Now, but I said, wait a minute now. Look. As long as you leave the private insurance companies in charge, they will find a way to manipulate these rules. So guess what's happened? Immediately. They found a way to manipulate the rules. So what are they doing? Well, uh, WellPoint and Coventry One, uh, two of the largest healthcare companies in the country, uh, are saying, hey, you know what? Well, then we're not going to cover any children. How do you like us now? Look, I'm going to do my, what did I tell you, second, go ahead, you tell me what I told you of this story, okay? I said, look, they're going to get rid of a whole bunch of people. They don't care. They just want to cover the richest people, right? Because they make a better profit margin off of them. They want to cover the healthiest people, the youngest people, etc. But whatever they might not make a good margin on, they're not the government. They don't give about the damn about the general welfare. They don't really particularly give a damn about their clients' welfare. Their job is to make as much money as possible. So if they say, oh, we're not making that much money off of kids, well, there goes the kids. Oh, they don't have health care anymore? Who cares? They're not my kids. I got no issues with that. So they've dumped all the kids from their uh, programs. And who are they blaming? They're blaming health care reform. They're blaming the Democrats. They're blaming Obama. Just like we told you they would. Why? Because we didn't get change. They're still in charge. They're going to keep raising our premiums and keep denying us health care. And they're going to find every other way to do it. Because there's no alternative. There's no public choice where we're going to, hey, you know what? If they deny my kids, I'm going to go and have, like, for example, a public option where I can go and get health insurance from the government and they won't let my kids get sick or die. Okay? Or my grandmother or anyone else. The CEO of United Health Group, Stephen Helmsley. Profits these insurance companies are making, folks, absolutely, they are obscene. I'm from Watertown, Wisconsin. We've lived in the city of Watertown for about six years now. I have three daughters. My oldest daughter is Adriana, she's 10 years old. My middle daughter is Kennedy and she's eight. And my youngest is Isabella, she turned five in April. Our world was pretty much turned upside down in a matter of minutes to us finding out that we would have a critically ill child who had not just one but multiple life-threatening disorders was just mind-boggling. At that point, ear infections were the worst thing in the world. We were told initially that the paperwork was lost. Um, a couple weeks later, we were told by United Healthcare it was denied. The big winners in this broken healthcare system, let's look at who they are. The CEO of United Health Group, Stephen Helmsley, is salary $3.2 million. The incredible gross profits of the private health insurance industry that is at the core of the problem. A few years ago, I think the president of United Healthcare um, made uh, so much money that one in every $700 that was spent in this country on healthcare went to pay him. So, 
Did you hear that? Pretty striking. It's, it's pretty amazing. They just it? got a little gasp out of yeah, those folks. Yeah, I know. Yeah. You're pulling it apart. We immediately appealed to see if we could get, you know, the the coverage that we needed, and our first appeal was denied. Bella was continuing to suffer through very painful G-tube feedings to the point where she would actually try and rip her G-tube out of her stomach because they hurt her so much. She was to the point where she would literally look at a spoon and vomit. And we would have to, my husband and myself would have to hold her so that she wasn't swinging at us. And I also really felt that it was United Healthcare's responsibility to pay for it. We were told no so many times. It was just, it was incredibly frustrating. If they didn't pay this one-time cost, she was going to suffer. Profits these insurance companies are making, folks, absolutely, they are obscene. He was six months old. We were at the pediatrician, and he mentioned that Dylan would probably need the Doc brand helmet to correct the plagiocephaly. And if he didn't wear this helmet, then he could potentially have issues eating. Two months into the treatment, we got the denial letter uh, from United Healthcare saying that they weren't going to cover it. They viewed the helmet as cosmetic. Why are we putting money into the profits of insurance companies rather than into medicine? My name is Steve Hemsley, and I'm the president and the chief executive of United Health Group. Our mission at United Health Group is to help people live healthier lives. And our more than 80,000 employees do this every day for more than 70 million Americans. My entire colon ended up getting large and pretty much dying and with no explanation they did several tests and after my second surgery and that's when they had to put me on the IV nutrition. Everything I ate just came straight through and was not being absorbed and that's why I had to have the TPN to keep me alive and to keep hydrated even. They kept telling my local pharmacy who was providing the TPN, oh, we're just waiting for one more letter or we're just waiting for one more script and then we'll start paying. This went on for six months and December 4th, both the pharmacy and I received a letter through United Healthcare saying that they deemed it medically unnecessary and that they were not going to pay any of it. I tried to explain to them that if I do not have this, I will die and the only response she gave me was okay. Government officials are actually calling this the biggest health insurance scam they have ever seen. The victims are patients, in many cases, very sick patients. To live in a society that would allow the CEO and higher executives of United Healthcare to make three quarters of a billion in stock, it's disgusting. It was also very frustrating to know that they made that money off the backs of people like me. Where is all that money going? I can't imagine the kind of house he has or house Behind all those numbers are real people. I don't know how in the world you call yourself an insurance health care giver. It's just ridiculous. Stephen Hemsley, how are you able to sleep at night? about how to modernize our health care system. Here's what's going on. They're now being driven by Wall Street. Cancel now. your coverage. He says it's not in their best interest. Now, the suit was brought by a number of institutional Has this shareholders. Ever happened to you? You go to a doctor. of unfair insurance reimbursement Criminal. rates. That's right, criminal charges. You see frequent evidence. Woe to anyone who gets between them and the profits they reap from seeing. Henry Waxman's going to put together um, so hearings in the uh, House side and he's going to bring in the healthcare industry executives and ask them exactly what I asked them to ask them, which is, hey, how did you uh, accumulate all the, to tell me about your stock options and tell me about your homes and how you accumulated your yachts and other things while you were denying people health care and they were dying. So to tell me about that practice of rescission again, because I found that kind of interesting. So tell me about it. In fact, you know, a couple of stories from that for, uh, for, from today, okay? South Carolina uh, court has just ruled that a, a kid with HIV who was denied coverage by his health care uh, company 
is going to get $10 million. You know why? He, got, he was about to give blood, and he found out that he had uh, HIV. And so they're like, whoa! The company involved was like, well, that's a lot of money, man, uh, to take care of this kid. He's 17. We didn't expect him to get sick. Insurance. What name so? <laughs> they're like, no, no. And they found a note from his nurse where they thought it said something that might be interpreted as possibly related to HIV. And they're like, ah, he should have known. He should have known. No, rescission. We're going to deny you coverage. And then later, in the middle of all this, a doctor comes out and says, no, 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 the nurse note had nothing to do with that. It is absolutely clear the doctors agree he did not have a pre-existing condition, and he did not know about it. He did not fill out any form wrong. They're like, yeah, on the other hand, it's still going to be expensive to cover him, so no. And, and they had a conservative judge in this case, and they came out and said, no, this is outrageous. You can't just not cover people. The whole point of your product is insurance. If they get sick, you're supposed to cover them. And you did this on purpose, $10 million. See how you like them apples. And that just uh, went above another case where a woman had cancer, and they got $9 million for it because they cut her and they, for the same things they knew, and they knew that they had no reasonable uh, basis to cut her, and they did just because they didn't want to pay it. They, there was a earlier House hearings that showed that the top five health care insurance companies in the country make $300 million a year through this practice of rescission. Rescission, all it is, is as soon as somebody gets sick, you go back and look at their old forms. If they filled anything out wrong, you deny them coverage. Two uh, pieces of news about health care in this country. First of all, California regulators have gone after Pacific Care. They were bought by United Health Group, and when they were uh, bought a couple of years back, uh, the United Health Group, which is actually the largest uh, health insurance company in the country, uh, said, oh, no, 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 don't worry. We're going to pay a lot of attention to California. We're going to do everything right, and we're not going to, you know, uh, lessen uh, our treatment of our clients and, and the doctors that work with us, et cetera. Everything's going to be hunky-dory. Come to find out it wasn't. Between 2006 and 2008, they uh, would routinely uh, mismanage medical claims, lose thousands of patients' documents, fail to pay doctors, and ignore calls to fix the problems. Now, why is that relevant? Because somebody gets a disease, and they need to get surgery right away. And Pacific Care says, oh, sad day, I lost your documents. You're going to have to wait on that. Meanwhile, that person is getting sicker and sicker, and a lot of them die, because they didn't get the treatment, right? Because they know, hey, if you die, I don't have to pay your bills. Now, that's really sick. And they know that if they don't pay the doctors, even after whatever procedure is done, that some percentage of the doctors will give up on it. Or some percentage of the doctors will take less. So these are the games they play with our lives. And with our livelihood, if you're in the medical profession, right? So you know what kind of fine uh, California has decided that they're going to go after uh, Pacific Care on? $9.9 billion. They're saying, we're coming for you. You know how many violations Pacific Air had in just that two-year period? Over a million. Now, you get a sense that this is a regular occurrence, that they do this on purpose to make more money while we all suffer, we get sicker, or sometimes we die? They don't give a damn. What did I tell you? Private insurance it's, is private. They're going to want to make a profit. And in healthcare, how do you make a profit? You pay less in terms of coverage, and you charge people more. And who gets screwed in between? We do. It is not something that private corporations will be good at doing, because they'll be too good at making a profit off of it. And we've told you about CEOs of groups like this before who have made billions of dollars. The CEO makes billions, and we don't get treatment. Every story you've heard is as sick or sad as the one before it or the one after it. Hopefully, I hope you're more informed about how the US healthcare system works in this country. So, what are you gonna do about it?